Okay, um, we're going to get started. Um, on behalf of the National Child Passenger Safety Board, thank you for joining us for Impaired Drivers and Child Passenger Safety. This webinar will discuss the data methodology, data sources, analysis, results, discussion in, and implications for the field of child passenger safety from a recent NHTSA study published in the Pediatrics Journal. Today's speakers are Tara Kelly Baker, Eduardo Romano, and Kieran Quinlan with NHTSA. I am Daniela Brown, the Ch child passengers, child restraint manufacturer representative and the vice chair elect on, on the National Child Passenger Safety Board. We have planned time to answer questions at the end of this presentation. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you. Just as a reminder, attendees are requested to not participate in this webinar. If you are operating a motor vehicle, the webinar will be recorded and you can listen to the recording when you are safely um, at your destination. Um, the everything will be posted on, on carseateducation.org and within one to two business days. For the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for the community education requirement and does not qualify for CPST CEUs. Please join me in welcoming Tara, Eduardo, and Kieran. Oh, hopefully there's a next slide. All right, there you go. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Tara Kelly Baker. I am the chief of the impaired driving division at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I have been conducting traffic safety research for well over two decades. I have a, um, a particular interest in families, children, and young drivers. Child endangerment issues have always been a burning uh, issue for me. In fact, I've been doing work with Eduardo and recent, more recently with Kyron um, on the topic. But uh, Eduardo and I have been doing this for at least 10 years, which really showcases how, uh, this, how persistent this problem is. And again, thank you for being here. With no further ado, let's get this presentation started. Next slide, please. Okay, so as all good presentations must start, there are some objectives that we would like you to have and uh, get after listening to this presentation. The first one is to understand the burden of child endangerment and its contribution to child passenger mortality in the US. Um, as I alluded to, uh, just a few seconds ago, this has been a persistent problem and one that we really appreciate you joining us to understand. Um, we also appreciate want you to appreciate the policy implications that stem from the epi epidemiological analysis of alcohol-related child passenger fatalities. Um, Kyron will be giving you some statistics, not just from our most recent uh, publication, but from some previous work. And finally, Eduardo will be presenting on the current state of child endangerment laws. Next slide. So this is not a new topic, um, but what's really sad is that it's very prevalent. So just a few days ago, I did just a quick search on Google to see what are today's headlines when it comes to child endangerment. All of these happened in, in uh, 2024. So this is, a, a, again, a prevalent problem, a persistent problem, um, and surprising given our um, technology improvements and what we hope are policy improvements. Next slide, please. So many of you may be familiar with Leandra's Law. It really brought child endangerment to the forefront. It was in honor of an 11-year-old girl um, and she was killed while she was in the vehicle with one of her friend's mothers who was severely intoxicated. The law was hailed as the toughest law for child endangerment of its time. But as you will learn is that laws um, are difficult to uphold and that there's a lot of leeway in courts. But uh, the law was implemented in 2009. Uh, first time offenders driving intoxicated, so that's 0.08 or higher 
um, or if they were impaired by drugs and driving a child 16 years or younger, um, could be charged with a class E felony, and that would be punishable up to four years. Unfortunately, in 2017, we learned that despite this law, um, there are still multiple offenders driving drunk with kids, and uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that we're hoping today to educate you on, and perhaps working together, we can do something about. Next slide. So with no further ado, let me introduce one of my favorite colleagues, Kyron. Thank you, Tara. Um, I am Kyron Quinlan. I'm a general pediatrician. Uh, that's sort of the cornerstone of who I am. Um, but I've been doing this kind of work uh, uh, for a bunch of years too. Um, and it's kind of neat because this topic was so near and dear to my heart and then I realized it's also very near and dear to Tara and Eduardo's hearts. And we found each other at a meeting, I don't know how long ago, over a decade ago. And we just became like, this is, we all, we're like, this is our thing. So, so it matters so much and we care so much about this. So um, I wanted to also start by just saying thank you to all of you. Um, I have had a whole bunch of various times in my career where I've been interacting with the child passenger safety technician community, including hiring several of them in our federally qualified health center in Chicago to do car seat checks during checkup visits. Um, and, uh, and I have deep respect for what you guys do and thank you so much. You're protecting kids and uh, that is that is fantastic. It's I know you don't, get rich doing this work. Um, and the funding is often challenging, but I just wanted to quickly say thank you for all that you do. And thanks to the board um, for hosting this and putting this on and pulling everybody together. Um, and to Daniela, uh, Kendra, and also Laura for all their stuff that had to happen to get this to happen. So, all right, next slide. Um, I do, I'll just mention child endangerment is what we've been calling when there's a, a drinking driver, an impaired driver who has a kid in the same car, that's child endangerment. And that child endangerment has broader meanings for pediatrics, you know, when there's other things that put kids at risk. But in this setting, we're talking that. Um, and just to give you a quick background, there's a whole bunch of literature that um, is there on this topic and we've uh, contributed significantly to that literature, but about 20% of all child passenger deaths involve an alcohol impaired driver. So one in five of all children who die as occupants, um, the crash involves alcohol. And this, this next line is something that came out of work that I, I trained at CDC and published something 24 years ago. Um, and it kind of blew my mind when we realized Oh my gosh, it was in my head that a drunk driver kills kids most likely because there's a family in one vehicle and there's a drunk driver in another vehicle and the drunk driver hits the family's car and the child in the family's car dies. That was in my head as probably how this happens. It turns out that is not how this usually happens. The usual pattern is that the child is being transported by the impaired driver. It's typically the child's own driver who is impaired in the crash in which the child dies. Um, one thing that we also found is that the higher the child's driver's blood alcohol level is, the more impaired that driver is, their own driver is, the more likely that that child who died in the crash was never buckled up, um, that they were not restrained in the crash. One other tidbit that's really makes hits a nerve and makes you want to work on this is that about two thirds or so of the impaired drivers survive. So most of the impaired drivers who are in these crashes in which their own child and passenger dies, most of the drivers live. Next slide. There are, so what do we do about this? We're going to get into that. One specific measure that we've been talking about for years, and this group, our group, has really thought about quite a bit, um, is, is something called child endangerment laws. And Mothers Against Drunk Driving as an organization 
has kind of pulled together a whole bunch about this. There's a whole topic area on their website and they've collected all of the state laws that there are. Um, and there's a variety of severities of these laws. And they're basically like additional penalties when someone gets a DUI. If you get a DUI with a child in your vehicle, then your DUI penalty is enhanced somehow. That's typically the structure of these laws. And we're going to get into how they don't stick too well. Um, and we'll get there. But um, And there has not been um, evidence of the real effectiveness of these laws I know Eduardo's got a whole bunch he's going to share with you on that. So I'm, I'm going to stop right there. But we're still working on some state-specific law that is really effective. Next slide. Um, so this is just like a slide to kind of give you a sense of like how long we've been working on this issue. Um, like I mentioned, when I was at CDC, I published this thing in 2000. So that's 24 years ago. Um, I contributed a bit to Ruth Schultz's update in 2004, um, and then put together another one in 2014. And then together, the, the whole group of us um, updated the national data just now in 2024. So we've got from 1985 on to the latest year that was available when we published this. So we've been looking at this for, for decades, literally decades. Um, and trying to um, be a good watchdog for how is this going and are we making any progress? Next slide. Um, so um, I'm going to um, um, share with you the, the latest information that we have. Um, from 2011, so this is like the last decade's worth of information. So for the last decade, there were almost 8,000 child passengers who died in motor vehicle traffic. And of them, you remember it's one in five involve alcohol. Well, this is the case still. About 22% of those are 1,755 kids died in crashes involving an alcohol impaired driver. Um, and that's overall impaired driver. Most are in the same vehicle. 64% um, died while riding in the same vehicle as the impaired driver. There are other deaths that occur. Uh, the minority of the deaths occur um, but there are some times where a child is killed when a drunk driver or alcohol impaired driver is in another vehicle. Um, the, um, the number of children who are injured in you know, deaths are kind of like the tip of the iceberg. For every death, there's a whole bunch of kids that are injured in these crashes, but don't die. And it's something about 20 times higher. So take the number of, of child passenger deaths, multiply that by 20, and that's the number of injured uh, children in these crashes as well. Next slide. Um, this looks like it didn't uh, somehow the the y-axis or something ended up kind of funny, but um, this is uh, from, what is this from? This is from 2014 publication. Um, Child passengers killed in reckless and alcohol-related motor vehicle crashes. I'm. I know this was this was Tara and Eduardo's um, thing, and I don't want to misrepresent it. I'm not sure what happened to the y-axis, um, oh. but I have a Eduardo. Do you have uh, do you have the y-axis in your head on this one? Uh, no, but it's basically the percent of children that have been uh, just to show that nothing has changed since 1995. Okay. 2011. It's a very flat curve that uh, yeah. we look at data from FARS from a long time ago. So and this is it, injured or killed yeah. um, by an, the percent maybe of the total. Okay, next slide. Um, and this is more recent. Um, this is more from our, our latest paper. And there's two lines on this. Um, we have the, the um, child fatalities per per 100,000 population, the, the uh, solid line on the top. Um, and that is the fatality rate. So look to the left for <clears> the, <throat> the corresponding y-axis um, for that one. And this is child fatality rates for kids who are killed in crashes in which their own driver was alcohol impaired. So these are child endangerment fatalities that we're talking about. And you can see the rate you know, it fluctuates year to year um, a little bit, um, but you can basically follow that solid line and see there's no improvement for sure. 
it does seem quite plateaued or maybe even heading in the wrong direction um, if you go left to right with the solid line. So from 2011 to 2020, um, it's not looking favorable in terms of prevention. Um, then if you look at the bottom line, the lighter solid line, um, the lighter solid line is the percent of all the, all the alcohol impaired crashes um, where the child was in a vehicle with an alcohol impaired driver. So um, it's every year, it's something like 60, 65% in that ballpark. The majority of the deaths of these type, when there's an impaired driver, it's usually the child's driver. Next slide. And this is a this is a figure that we did back in 2000, and we've repeated it in each of these um, each of these uh, publications. And that's basically this: that we looked at restraint use for the child passenger deaths, um, and co connected it to their own driver's blood alcohol concentration. Um, also, we looked at it by age. So the vertical height of these bars all represents restraint use rates. And those rates for zero to four, five to nine year olds and 10 to 14 year olds, each one of those age groups has a height of a vertical bar for if the driver had not been drinking, um, which is on the left. The middle bar for each of the age groups is if the driver had been drinking but does not get to the legal limit. So under 0.08. And then the bar right bar for each of the age groups is if the uh, the it's the uh, restraint use for children who are who die in crashes when uh, when their own driver had reached their legal limit or had a higher blood alcohol content. And so basically, what you see the pattern here is that res restraint use decreases for each of the age groups as their own driver's blood alcohol content increases. So to put in plain English, the more a driver had been drinking, the less likely it is that they buckled their child up in the, in the crash or the child in their vehicle in that crash in which the child died. Um, that is uh, the case. You also sort of gently see a trend that as you go up in age groups, uh, uh, the restraint use decreases. And that's kind of a truth regardless of alcohol too. Um, next slide. Um, really quick, uh, as I mentioned, 69% of the impaired drivers in these crashes in which their own child, their own child passenger died, 69%, um, the majority survived um, in those crashes. The majority of these fatal crashes involved a single vehicle. Um, so 60% of these were just one vehicle. It wasn't like they were hitting anybody else. Um, and the majority also about two thirds also occurred at night. Um, compared to drivers who had not consumed alcohol, but who had a child passenger fatality in their vehicle, um, alcohol impaired drivers were more likely to be male, more likely to be previously convicted of DUI, and more likely to not have a valid driver's license at the time of the crash. Next slide. Um, this is just to get a sense of, of the size of this and uh, trends of this. Um, and kind of, I went through, I went through the old papers that we did and then brought the new paper into it too. So you see these four lines um, from 85 up to 2020. Um, and the overall trend is there has been a gentle decline from the eighties to around 2010 in the annual number of child endangerment deaths. Um, but once you get to 2010, um, as I showed you before, this figure is the figure that I showed you before, that upper solid line shows you that in the last decade, there's really been no progress. And maybe we're heading in the wrong direction gently. Um, the uh, total number of kids that die per year of this exact problem currently averages around 112 per year um, in the country. Next slide. Um, this is just a taste of the um, issue of child, child endangerment laws, and, and, uh, and we, did, we did a paper where we looked basically at state-specific rates of child endangerment deaths, um, which obviously has big relevance to, um, you know, what do we do about it and consider legislation 
and where is the where are the areas that really could use um, like the prevention has the opportunity for big benefit. Um, the south central part of the country does seem to be um, you know an area that for whatever reason it has it has uh, uh, higher rates than other parts of the country. Um, there are, there's more to this and I'm gonna let um, Eduardo kind of share a bit more about efforts, um, efforts to, uh, to address this with, with child endangerment laws. Uh, next slide. I think it might be, yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Eduardo at this point. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, really, it's, it's a pleasure to be, to talk about this, and so really, really thank you. I think for all you are doing. Um, oh, this is Eduardo Romano. I have to introduce myself. This is Eduardo Romano. I uh, am working at the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, PIRE. Um, I'm an economist by training, but I have been working on traffic safety for a while, a lot with Tara, uh, more literally also with Karen. And we are, I'm working on different topics, but basically uh, more interested in uh, vulnerable populations, those who are more, more vulnerable to traffic safety problems, and kids is one of them. So I've been uh, working on this for quite a bit right now. And in this case, I um, in this presentation now, I will talk a little bit in more detail about something that you that has been already some white, our child endangerment laws uh, have been defined, but I, I, I will present what we did in a little bit more of detail. Uh, next, please. Well, yeah, th these laws basically are, uh, as I said, they are intended to protect kids uh, from uh, being injured or put at risk by in, uh, drinking driving. Most most US states have now what you call child endangerment law. Uh, they are different. They are not having the US, it's not a uniformity. There are quite a, a huge variation in how these laws uh, are implemented. So we wanted to examine these laws. Are they working or how different they are? Is there any reason why they are working better or not? And uh, in order to do that, what we did is, um, uh, next please. Yeah, we created um, a model in which basically a statistical model in which one side we have the outcome or will be uh, a kid is uh, killed or injured by a drinking driver as a function of different factors. One of them is uh, would be the person of the child endangerment law. We want to know if this is a factor that explains the outcome. And others are the driver's gender, the driver's uh, um, where the kid is uh, seated in the in the car. Uh, so we wanted to account for a lot of factors. But our interest is at the point was looking at does gender laws influence or have an impact in protecting the kids. Now, the first thing that we notice is that there are different meanings. The laws are very different. Uh, and it's very hard to read what, I, I don't understand what, what this scripts about the law is. But we have uh, certain um, uh, legal researchers, people that are sort of lawyers that can look at all these different uh, statutes and come out with a way to synthesize that information into variables or elements that can allow us to analyze the data. And what I am presenting here is that they come up with nine elements, different parts of the laws that um, we took into account because not all states have the same laws. Just to give you an, this is slide just to give you an idea that how how they are in which ways these laws are different. Uh, the type of law, for instance, enhances uh, basically what uh, Karen said before is that to a 
usual DUI penalty, there are an addition of penalty when a kid was present in the car. Separate is, well, no, now we have a separate DUI CLO. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a, within the, the legal framework. It's not just enhance this one, it's a different one. And aggravating is different. Is this when the, the law allows the court to decide uh, on the penalty. Um, they can uh, punish the driver more or less regarding the, 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 the issue. The, the court is encouraged to consider the presence of a child uh, when determining the, the, the penalty for a DUI violation. So there are different ways. And all the other kind of characteristics, which is the age of the driver, different states uh, define an adult driver uh, of different ages, others, the, what is a kid, uh, it's a felony. Uh, there are mandatory child penalties uh, or multipliers or what kind of penalty. So there are different elements that define how strong, how, uh, um, strong a, a, a law was. Next, please. Uh, well, how do we manage this from an analytical point of view. There are so many differences. So we come up with ideas, okay, let's arbitrarily say that a strength, there's a valuation, then the value to each one of the characters, uh, uh, which one of these different types of laws. Um, this is very arbitrary. We come up with this out of common sense, a real, study with more data will require a very, um, it would be a different study, just looking at how to define the perfect valuation for each study. But out of common sense, we, we're talking with uh, experts, with a legal expert, this is the valuation. We, we value each one of this, uh, put the value to each one of these different categories, and then we add it up. Next, please. Just to give you an idea, we uh, that's how all the uh, states I have at that time uh, came up with a measure of how strong their law was. Please don't, again, uh, this is something that allow us to look at variability and that's why I'm showing this. Don't, if you are one of those states, don't, don't be too, proud or ashamed it's, it's not a really it's, it's not it looks for variation more than precision regarding where the, the one state is the other according to this for instance new york which is the where the leandro's law was um was some one of the really one of the states with one of the strongest um uh child endangerment laws um, but again, this just to give you an idea well, how do we decided to look at this. Not only we look at the presence or absence of a law, but also how strong the law was. Next, please. Uh, well, then we have, we merge this data with crash data. So we have, uh, we use the FARS, which for those of you know is, uh, census of fatal crashes in the United States. Very good data set. Has a lot of information about the driver, the kids, where it was placed. Uh, it's a census, it's one of the sample. It's all crashes in the United States where the fatality took place. There are some certain rules appear here. So we, for each one of these uh, cases, now we have the state in which took place. And also we have the, if there was a child, was not a child, the age of the driver. Uh, and we also have information about what was the type of law that was present at that time. Uh, and again, we have this regression that we, this model in which a uh, statistical model we apply to look what happened. Next, please. Um, so we were looking at the percent of children killed by drinking driver, one type of law, and the potential 
what was the potential law had any impact on, on the outcome. If you next one, there will be the the outcome. Next, please. Yeah, next, please. <laughs> Basically, this is the outcome of these two questions. Nothing. We we look at the percent of children killed by drinking driver, and no, there was no pattern. No, no, no. The out well, the outcome was not influenced by the type of law. The 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 outcome. The 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 the, the pattern of kids, uh, children, death was not influenced by the variation in strength. Uh, next, please. Uh, if you just compare simply before and after the law was imposed, it was enacted. Next, please. Nothing. There was no impact. What makes sense if we saw the data was very flat? So how we were, at that point we weren't expecting nothing, but and when we do the real analysis, nothing happens. Next, please. So what were the results? Uh, as expected, given the data we were looking at the tables, child development policies have no impact. When we look at these models, uh, what really explain the outcome, the, the, the likelihood that a kid was killed by their own yeah, impaired driver, what more than loss was the only thing that were at this time influenced were where the chill child was seated and the driver's gender. If it's a male, more likely to, to, to be the offended driver than female. These two factors in our model were more important than loss. Those were not explaining nothing. Next, please. So what are the conclusions? Um, well, they are not effective, so why? So we were, well, one is public awareness. Do we, does, does the public know about child endangerment? What's the culture? What's the, 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 do they really think that uh, it's a problem? They, that they can handle the, the, I drink and drive and I can handle it. Uh, these are the issues that we have to figure out. This, is the public aware of the problem, really? Uh, not well enforced. Does, do we think that the police, there are laws that are there, are, are they enforced at all? Um, yes, they are, but perhaps not that much. And, uh, well, what happened once it is enforced, goes to court, what happened? Um, really, we learned that quite a bit of them have um, been used as a plea burning. We, we have a, a study with uh, math in which we look at uh, records, uh, anecdotal records or records of things that happen in court and uh, quite a bit of them, the proportion of um, using this, this channel of that plea bargaining tools were very high. So, well, with all, it's no surprise that the laws are not working. Next, please. So what, what do we need to, to improve? Well, several things. I'm, I'm just to, to move this forward. One is the challenge of laws clearly are not working. They are unrealistic. So we need to understand why people are doing this, uh, who are doing this, and have a law that really matches that behavior. And they need to be uniform because the variation is so large. We, it's very hard for somebody who was in a state. I know in another state, I have to behave, no, they have to be more, more uh, doing stronger and uniform across states. We have to identify groups of who are really uh, endangered children. And why? Clearly, those who have alcohol problems is 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 an issue, obvious. But uh, it's possible that some of these that were drinking one day and they said I can handle it. There are not people that really are strong. Not only I don't know, but it's perhaps not only those who are 
really uh, with alcohol problems the only ones that are creating issues here we don't know but we have to learn who are these the motivations for these kids um and we will have to educate and intervene to differently to different people with different problems so and the last one is all so far all our laws are focusing on alcohol and that's good what happened with cannabis um or drugs well i'm talking about cannabis but um we have some we have conducted a study in washington state and we learned that most drivers there with kids don't think that driving after using cannabis is a problem. Some of them even think that I'm a better driver after using cannabis. Okay, cannabis is not as, generally speaking, uh, alcohol is the one uh, drug that is kills more, more than cannabis, but cannabis is not, uh, can impair. And people uh, are really thinking that, a lot of people thinking that it's no problem at all. And our legal system is not taking into account what happened with cannabis at this point uh, for kids. So there are other considerations for the future. We have a problem that is flat and maybe increasing, and there is a lot of things that are not working and we don't know why. And I think it's the last one. Next. Yes. Now, Tara. Thank the, you. You. Oh, yes, yes. So back back to me. And um, I want to um, share what Kyron and Eduardo and I talked about as far as like considerations um, for improvements, perhaps, or um, thoughts on um, what might make some of the changes. Uh, and bear with me if some of this is uh, repetition, since um, Kyron and Eduardo were presenting the actual data. So as Eduardo last um, alluded to, we, we have new drugs other than alcohol that are readily available, whether they're medicinal or they're um, recreationally legalized. They do have an impact on DUI. And those are some of the things that should be considered for changes in policies or strengthening of policies, understanding that some of these policies in and of self are not necessarily effective, but there may be an opportunity as we relook at some of our DUI laws and consider other drugs than alcohol, that there might be something to address in child end endangerment. Um, a lot of people who know me and know how much I speak on child endangerment and the challenges um, in addressing this problem really do have to do with awareness, with training, and with education. And by that, I mean for everybody, the general public. Likely, my experience at least has been, the general public are making an assumption that our courts and our law enforcement officers are handling the problems. Um, it's not an illogical assumption, but we know that the criminal justice system, prosecutors have a lot of leeway in courts um, for multiple different reasons. And so that obviously decreases the strength of those policies. Um, so general public understanding of the laws, what they are, and the limitations of what our criminal justice system can and cannot do are important considerations in child endangerment. Um, next slide, please. I also want to note some considerations with regards to what we call general deterrence and specific deterrence. So general, obviously meaning more of the, the general public when we look at deterring alcohol impaired driving. So some of the potential uh, improvements in not just child endangerment DUI laws, but in impaired driving in general, um, have often been associated or suggested that stricter enforcement of B BAC laws, lowering of BAC laws, many may be aware that Utah has brought their BAC uh, legal level to 0.05, as multiple countries around the globe have also, and some even down to 0.02 or zero tolerance. Um, there's also been some discussion that increasing sobriety checkpoints um, could have an effect on DUI child endangerment laws 
as the increase in price of alcohol. These are general deterrence measures that overall can improve the numbers, reducing the numbers of alcohol impaired drivers. And when we reduce those, we make an obvious impact on child endangerment specifically. Also looking at specific deterrence um, for those driving children impaired. So specific deterrence as far as those who drink and drive. Ignition interlock laws and having ignition, ignition interlocks are a proven countermeasure to keep people uh, off the roads from drinking while those interlocks are on. Um, some states actually require ignition interlocks for offenders who have been found to be drinking and driving with children, but not all laws. And there is definitely an improvement to using ignition interlocks and looking at uh, offenders and repeat offenders who are often those with children. Screening and assessment of DUI offenders cannot emphasize this enough. We need to do more to screen and assess those who DUI to determine whether or not they're going to reoffend. Again, that is a specific deterrent that could help impaired driving, but certainly could help children who are in vehicles with, in, uh, with drivers who repeatedly drink and drive. Um, there's been some uh, discussion around whether lower BACs while transporting children. Um, obviously, uh, there are um, commercial vehicles like truckers and others who have lower BACs, some zero. So there could be some considerations around BAC and um, for those with children. And finally, increased enforcement of child restraint laws, especially at night. So if the data, the data showed a lot, but one of the things that the data definitely showed is the need to get these child children restrained. And we've made a lot of progress and technicians such as yourself are making um, huge differences. That is the way we can protect children. Um, it may be the only way we can protect children when they're in a vehicle with somebody who's drinking and driving. Um, next slide, please. So um, I don't want us to present all of this gloom and doom um, without at least giving you some thoughts of what you could walk away with and how maybe we all could better improve this situation, stop that line from going up and maybe even make that line go down. Um, so just increasing the awareness of, of this issue. So maybe there's an opportunity for you to talk to health professionals. Maybe there are local community groups uh, that would be interested in hearing about the dangers of child endangerment and the challenges with the, the laws and enforcement of those laws. If you like writing, maybe there's opportunities to write an op-ed, newspapers. There's also um, devoted, com there's commentaries that can be written. Um, just, you know, doing what you can to increase awareness about the issue could go a long way to get general public support. I also really encourage you as technicians to learn about what your state's child endangerment laws, they vary considerably. And my conversations with a lot of law enforcement is that not even they necessarily know what their law is, making it even more difficult for them to, um, to enforce. So once they understand the law, which is great, there's a whole host of challenges that our law enforcement have to go through. If they put a child endangerment uh, clause onto that DUI, they're going to be dealing with child protective services. That's going to take a lot, a lot of time consuming energy for them and then getting into courts um, for them to be ple pled down. So um, I encourage you learn what your child endangerment law is and support your local law enforcement. Um, related, when possible, educate parents educate caregivers about safety, not just about drinking and driving, which might seem uncomfortable for some conversations. Um, shouldn't be, but I understand it can be. But like when you're talking about seatbelts, when you're talking about distraction, take the opportunity to talk about driving alcohol free. Um, maybe you can even develop materials that can be part of education packages that you distribute during your um, checks. And um, most of all, you know, we could use more people helping with this issue. Get involved. 
perhaps volunteer with your local impaired driving organizations. Every MAD has a state chapter, SAD. There are multiple groups um, addressing impaired driving that could use volunteers, especially volunteers like you, um, who have a devotion and a dedication to young people. And consider advocacy opportunities to strengthen the laws. Um, when possible, if it's in your, your wheelhouse, testify at state legislature, legislatures. Do what we can to, to get the voices heard for the children who don't have those voices. Next slide. So just a few resources. They don't really end here. I really just wanted to put this picture of this child up here because I thought it was absolutely adorable. Um, again, we've mentioned MAD. MAD does do a lot with child endangerment. And they've been really supportive of Kyra and Eduardo and I in doing the work around child endangerment. CDC is another huge supporter of this effort and trying to get more research out to see what can be done. Um, Foundation for Advancing Alcohol Responsibility has um, materials that you can go to their website for, as does the National District Attorneys Association. Uh, so the resources don't end there. If you want more information, myself, Eduardo, Kyron, um, any one of us are more than willing to share um, our articles that we have written and um, to promote our partners' work when it comes to child endangerment. So I think I've left about 14 minutes um, for questions. Um, and it doesn't even just have to be questions. I would also really welcome comments, um, stories, because a lot of us need to hear. I know I, I learn a lot by hearing from professionals and what their challenges are in addressing um, DUI and child endangerment. So speak up, see what we have. Yes. Um, so as Tara alluded to, we it is time for questions. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and thank the three of you, Tara, Eduardo, and Kyron, um, for joining us and sharing this information. It is much appreciated and our field of child passenger safety appreciates it as well. So if you have not done so already, please enter your questions in the Q&A um, box. Looks like we have a few here. Our, oh, looks like Joe's was answered. Um, I will I will mention it anyway, just to reiterate, because perhaps it was missed. Um, did you look at not only the presence of form of law, but whether the laws were actively and visibly enforced? During the analysis, no, we don't. Uh, that's a very important question because uh, uh, that's the, that's the issue, enforcement is one of the issues that we have. No, there was no data. Um, what we we were not, uh, there was no, so the, in our analysis, enforcement of the law was not part of this basically because we have no information, uh, reliable information that can be used to look at how uh, much was enforced. But, I, and I will share anecdotally is that, um, we don't have the numbers, but it is a challenge for law enforcement to enforce for, for multiple reasons. One, because not, as I mentioned, a lot of law enforcement aren't necessarily up to date on what the child endangerment statute is for their state. And those um, that are, um, and they actually add the DUI child endangerment uh, uh, charge to the DUI um, have a host of hurdles, paperwork to go through. Um, like I said, they have child protective services that they're going to have to um, work with. And then when they get to court, what is challenging for a lot of law enforcement is they've done all this work and then it's often pled down because prosecutors do have a lot of leeway. And so that often demotivates uh, many law enforcement officers. Um, so you'll see um, MAD uh, does keep some records. Uh, not, they're not of all courts, but they do track a lot of DUI cases. And many cases of DUIs, they never even had the child endangerment uh, citation put onto the charge. So it is challenging. Okay. Um, another question we have is how do you help educate LEO, which I'm assuming is law? enforcement officers of the laws themselves? Excellent question. I'll, I'll start it, but if Eduardo and Kyron, you have um, more, please jump in. 
Um, I think, you know, at NHTSA, we have law enforcement liaisons, and I'm hoping as um, a new, a fairly new NHTSA person, um, that we can work with law enforcement liaisons, also hoping that we can work with prosecutors, traffic safety prosecutors, and judicial folks to educate them. I think, um, you know, as government and as um, representatives of this industry, traffic safety, we could do a lot just with formalized training, but I also do believe that even technicians, all of us, if you're working with law enforcement um, during your checks, take the opportunity to mention it. Um, if you work in community groups with law enforcement, whether they're maybe perhaps task forces or coalitions, there's opportunities to engage in conversation with law enforcement, um, as well as others who are gonna be in the court system, child protective services, um, prosecutor judges. So I think that it's, you can, we, we should as a nation do more training for our law enforcement, but I also think that as general public, we could have these conversations with law enforcement as well. Yeah, I will add that um, uh, if we could get in one jurisdiction the chiefs of some uh, uh, office uh, to um, really be interested in this problem. Uh, it becomes a priority for a jurisdiction. This is, this will, the officers will react to the leadership within their own uh, jurisdiction and, um, and things will, so it's not just educate the officer, the patrol officer, but if we can get the chief to become, to be sure, the sheriff, the chief, to be sure that this will be a, an important issue, things will, will improve immediately. Okay, um, looks like we have some comments. Um, I sit on the DU, oh, looks like it just shifted to answered. Um, let me see if I can grab that. Okay, I sit on DUI task forces, drive smart and save kids as a firefighter in my region and state level tasks as well. It looks like um, Lisa also commented on she works in rural areas. Um, so this has given her more to bring to the table in your in their discussions there. So she's appreciative of the presentation. Um, Stephanie Trombalo has mentioned uh, just an offer. Go to carseat.org for posters addressing the issue available to download. There's a flyer there that summarizes much of the data for reference. And they're working on asking technicians to share information with colleagues in many fields because many have no idea that this is an issue. So she is extremely um, happy that you have presented the high points of your in-depth presentation. Uh, Joe, Joe has a comment. As you were summarizing, Tara, I thought about some challenges. They include nighttime enforcement of OPC laws when considering visibility and tinted windows, uniform court acceptance of field sobriety testing when considering impairment beyond alcohol. Training not only LEO, but prosecutors, including, oh, and judges to reduce plea. Sorry, I've got to go down here. <laughs> plea bargaining. Any thoughts on what we can do about those? I, I, again, you know, I go um, back to there does, I do feel that um, formalized training for judges and prosecutors is really important. But, you know, a lot of judges are elected. Um, and a lot of judges go through education. And I think that there's an opportunity if we could get general public to be more aware um, that, you know, often if, the, if, if something, if there's a hot item, we can often get people better educated. So it, it at least put, puts it on their radar, so to speak. Um, so, you know, if we can motivate our judges and our prosecutors not to plea by getting the general public on board to say, hey, we don't wanna see another child lose a life to their own drinking driver. There should be stricter laws. Like we need to get the general public on board to put a little pressure on those courts to really rethink about pleading those out. Um, I, that would be my, my one thought. Byron, Eduardo, any other thoughts from you guys? Oh, I, I agree with you that I think at, at the end is what the public wants. Uh, 
they were forced changes. Uh, laws enforcement, they don't act in a, in a vacuum. They respond to what is the what the public sees. And right now we we I think that the public is very well aware of not don't leave your kid in the car in the summer because not the dog because that would be a problem. And I'm not sure that they are aware that well I can drink a little bit and drive is also a problem. So we need the I, I, I second what Tara is saying. Is we need to work in different fronts, um, and that will help the officers, uh, patrol officers, the, the the courts to to react as we expect they do if the public is really behind this. You know, I'll just mention one other aspect to this is the. If you just step back and think about if a, a person is gets into a situation where they they've had too much to drink, they are going to get behind the, the wheel and they have a kid that they are transporting. You kind of wonder if if not a DUI is probably something that makes them think twice like getting a DUI, if they've never had a DUI or they've had one DUI or something, it like that could be in their head. Whether the slight additional penalty of doing it when a child is you in your vehicle, is that is that enough of a deterrent? And I guess we all kind of realize like it's it's a little more than a DUI. It does have potential to be a lot more if you're in New York in particular, um, where there's felony level uh, charges that can come against you. Whether people know that uh, is another question. And then how it gets plead out and, and doesn't stick too well uh, when it gets down to it. You know, The DUI may stick and the child endangerment law may not stick. Um, so it, all I'm saying is this is, this is a hard thing. This is not easy. It's not like one simple message and buckle up and it's all over and we can move on to our next problem. These are kids that are trusting their own driver to be responsible. And they can't, a five-year-old and eight-year-old cannot be expected to be the one to figure out how dangerous it is. Um, we have to do something about this. and. It's not easy. State laws are one approach. Awareness is another approach. Support of law enforcement, support of prosecutors, um, alcohol programs, ignition interlock stuff. Every, it's every all hands on deck. These are kids and we absolutely have to do this. One other quick thing I just wanna mention, all of the CPS techs, I want you guys to know something. You guys have such natural partners in pediatricians. We love you guys. We are your best friends. The, the current president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which represents 67,000 pediatricians in the country, is Ben Hoffman, and he is a CPS tech himself. He's actually a tech instructor, or what used to be called tech, what is it called, senior tech now or something like that. It's like next level, whatever. And so he's, and he gives talks to all the pediatricians every year on this topic it's it's so you have you have such make bridges talk to the pediatricians in your area work together change the laws help the kids thank you kyron um if you have ever had a chance to hear dr hoffman speak to he's a very dynamics um pre presenter as well so um so it looks like we are running out of time um we do have one more comment i will mention um their anonymous attendee said, I would think the depolicing of Americans the last four years has an impact on this. Law enforcement has become reactionary and not proactive anymore. Coming from the law enforcement world, it's hard to find people who even want to be law enforcement officers anymore. So, um, all right. So I am going to um, we go move on here. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers, um, first and foremost, for sharing this information and all of the resources you have provided. So thank you. Um, before we go, we have a few closing announcements. We hope that you're enjoying the National Child Passenger Safety Board webinar series. We are having fun delivering them. 
We hope you will join us on Tuesday, August 13th for a community education webinar to help prepare you for CPS week in September. Visit cpsboard.org forward slash webinars to register, or you can simply just scan the code right here. Okay, if you may also be aware that the national CPS wards are open. So if you work with a technician, instructor, or child passenger safety team that goes above and beyond, please take the time to recognize them at cpsboard.org forward slash awards. The nominations close at the end of the summer on August 31st. You can please email secretariat at cpsboard.org with any questions. We are also looking for a public safety fire EMS representative to join the National Child Passenger Safety Board for the May 2025 to May 2028 term. If you or someone you know is in the fire EMS field and actively working in child passenger safety and interested in applying, please visit cpsboard.org forward slash learn dash about dash the dash board forward slash board dash membership. You can also email secretariat at cpsboard.org with any questions. And finally, um, thank you to everyone for attending. Um, the webinar recording will be posted to carseateducation.org within one to two business days. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers. Have a safe day and thank you for all you do to help keep children, passengers, children, passengers, and their families safe. Uh, Kendra, could you please stop the recording?